coat of arms. That's an unique symbol or sign that would uh, signify a group of people or a particular country or an emblem of a particular area so that it will be distinguished from all others. When the warriors belonging to the two opposing sides would meet on the battlefield, they would uh, wear some sort of a shield or they would place their unique emblem somewhere else so that they can distinguish their own people from the enemy. That is the very definition of a coat of arms. It is this type of a unique uh, emblem or a symbol that would be different from those who do not belong to your group or country or clan or whatever it signifies. So keeping this definition in mind, doesn't it seem strange that uh, too many countries in the past, and not only countries, also cities, areas, and all kinds of uh, things that uh, would have their own emblem, would have the very same one, the double-headed eagle. Didn't all these countries have a single artist that could come up with an unique idea? Or maybe there were too many double-headed chicks wandering on the streets of these uh, countries to the extent that they were the um, main thing in the country? Mainstream historians assure us that it was always uh, the case of copying. I mean, they see somebody else has the emblem and they adopt it for themselves. But this contradicts simple logic. I mean, the full a point of having an emblem that identifies you as something unique, for example, a unique country, doesn't uh, serve its purpose anymore because you have the same symbol as your neighbor. Or was it actually that the people really belonged to one single group, one uh, single empire, and they showed it on their coat of arms. This not only seems much more logical, but also elegantly fits with all the other artifacts that I have been showing for so many episodes, exposing the truth that the full history was quite different from what we are led to believe it was. Even cultures that are labeled as pre-Columbian were using this emblem, although they developed supposedly in complete isolation from Europe and Asia, where the double-headed eagles are really all over as emblems and coats of arms. The symbol of the double-headed eagle is present in almost all of the cultures that we usually call most ancient.
that we call Middle Ages, the symbol of the double-headed eagle is adopted in one form or another in all European countries. Practically, it is all over uh, the state coats of arms, the coats of arms of uh, towns and uh, cities and everything else you can imagine. The examples are countless, but um, some examples are not convenient for mainstream historians like uh, this one, denoting all the areas that have this symbol as belonging to one central, single governmental uh, structure. We are always taught that these um, areas and towns and countries just came up with the same symbol independently of each other. Currently, the double-headed eagle is still present in the coats of arms in only four countries, and they all happen to be Slavic. Those are Albania, Serbia, Russia and Chernogora. They all happen to be Slavic because uh, the Slavic countries left this um, uh, union of um, the areas that were honoring the survival culture relatively at a later stage of its uh, decay. The symbol is also widely used by the church, of course. Again, the examples here are countless. It is the symbol of almost all the major empires that uh, are more or less uh, symbolic. They were created as some sort of uh, labels to organize the historical fiction that mainstream uh, science is presenting to us. But anyway, as they created these uh, empires, it seems again and again people had no imagination. So all of them, uh, the Byzantine and uh, also Roman emperors are seen depicted with the double-headed eagle on their chest and uh, their paraphernalia and uh, of course the continuation, the Holy Roman Empire, the Russian Empire, all those that uh, claim to have uh, continued uh, the Roman tradition, they have the very same emblem and coats of arms, the double-headed eagle. That doesn't make much sense from the point of view of uh, the commonly believed uh, history uh, that uh, different uh, countries uh, would adopt the same symbol to distinguish between each other, <laughs> which is quite confusing, but it makes perfect sense from the uh, point of view of the new chronology, according to which they had the same symbol because they simply belonged to the same empire. This is an image from the old Degerton manuscript. It depicts the legendary King Arthur fighting another knight. A double-headed eagle is depicted on the shield. King Arthur is very famous in England and that is why some uh, native English people, not uh, only one, a few of them decided to really trace the roots of this um, uh, legend and made a meticulous uh, research about the true identity of King Arthur. And their uh, findings uh, were uh, quite in line with um, the new chronology. Few of them reached to the conclusion that, that amazingly enough he was some sort of a blonde uh, barbarian that uh, it seems that must have come from somewhere the shores of the Danube River. Well, I think we know who are uh, these uh, blonde so-called uh, barbarians with uh, magical abilities. Double-headed eagle is revered uh, in the context of the Vedic culture as well, known under the name of uh, Ganda Beruda or simply Beruda, and is uh, considered over there to be an incarnation of Lord Vishnu. And probably uh, that is the only clue that uh, we have about the original meaning of this uh, most ancient uh, symbol, which is so old that uh, we practically cannot uh, trace its original meaning. The double-headed eagle is also uh, widely used in um, the secret organization of the Masons. And that is why some people mistakenly classify it as Masonic symbol altogether. But that is erroneous uh, because the symbol was subsequently uh, adopted and used. It was borrowed from the already existing symbols. 
which is the case with uh, many other symbols collected from all religions that uh, they use as well. It doesn't mean that they were the original creators of these symbols and it doesn't mean that the symbols originally bared the meaning that the Masons ascribe to them. After the new fabricated history was imposed upon the society with force by the means of the very bloody war nowadays uh, masked as a reformation period, so after the reformators felt uh, victorious, they um, did not feel comfortable anymore with the imperial symbol of the double-headed eagle, which was still on the arms of uh, courts of uh, various uh, towns and countries. So they solved that uh, problem by simply chopping off its eastern side. And as a result, it um, took the form of a single eagle or uh, as in the case of um, uh, this one that you see of the town of uh, Pilsen, literally only half of it uh, remained. They didn't even bother to change uh, the image to make it look like a proper eagle. But always when they were chopping in such a manner, they always chopped the head that was uh, looking towards the east, towards the place of the empire of the survivors. But chopping off half of the eagle is just symbolic. The most important task was to chop off our true knowledge and they embarked on this task using various subtle methods. For example, take a look at the continents on our planet. The parasites who consider themselves treated preferentially by God and destiny didn't want to live uh, even on the same continent as uh, the survivors, that was uh, beyond their dignity. That's why they artificially divided the continent of Asia, which was named after the Aces, which originally was the name of the survivors, and made a part of it their own, calling it Europe. Not only was Europe a place where they would feel home and uh, a place from where they would spread their influence all around the world, but also they made uh, Europe to look like uh, the giver of civilization and innovation by forging the real history in a fashion that it would look at the end that all the technical innovations that were given to us by the survivor culture were supposedly invented, well, mostly and preferably in Europe. Wikipedia informs us that the very idea and definition of continent is a cultural thing. Then why do we study it in geography classes? They're just another subtle way to um, assert the imaginary supremacy of the European political forces on the world scene as, for example, contrasting with the uncivilized dirty Asia. And all that is just so that the people will continue believing in all these fires and will continue dancing according to the music that is played by Europe. Because again, when I say Europe, I don't mean the general population of uh, the people of Europe, but just the political forces that uh, have uh, seized um, power at the current moment. Although the Ural Mountains in Russia are definitely very rich in history, they are not at all high or special in any way from geographical point of view to uh, deserve the honor to divide continents. They cannot in any way uh, stand to the mighty Himalayas, for example, or many other mountain ranges around the world, world uh, from a geographical point of view. Also, the river Uzinkaya, its very name means small and narrow, has also been placed as a border between continents. It's a kind of a small brook or a regional river that cannot be compared to other bodies of water, even in the very same region, what to speak on a world scale. Also, I can assure you that the land on its both shores, on both sides, looks absolutely the same. There is no difference. 
by listening to the mainstream uh, so-called innocent uh, news that uh, simply seem to represent facts without much judgment, we are actually constantly exposed to a systematic manipulation of our belief system that would uh, result in the current deplorable state of affairs around the world of wars and pollution. Just one example. In the vicinity of uh, Stonehenge, using the technology of the ground uh, penetrating uh, sensor devices, a new, uh, much bigger stone circle has been discovered. That is barely a surprise because uh, bigger circles of the same design as uh, shown on this uh, simulation are already there in the area of Stonehenge. I saw one uh, during my visit there years ago. Indeed, I enjoyed my visit to that second uh, circle much more because it definitely looked authentic and it was um, the access was free. Uh, anybody could go and touch and enjoy the stones. And most importantly, again, it, it felt uh, really authentic, uh, while uh, the Stonehenge, if it is at all an ancient uh, monument, which many people already question seriously with uh, very good uh, grounds, if it is ancient indeed, there is uh, very little left of uh, its uh, original uh, outlook due to its uh, rearrangement, which is uh, well uh, documented uh, with uh, photos and footage and is not even kept secret by the uh, British government. Some of that footage you can see in my video Planet of the Megaliths. But uh, let's get back to the story. So a bigger circle was found and that's fine, but pay attention to the article that was published in this regard. Its very first sentence Stonehenge occupies one of the richest archaeological landscapes in the world. My god, that's a pretty loaded statement. Well, there could be miracles that we don't know anything about somewhere under there, but w we haven't discovered any of those uh, miracles. And I beg your pardon, uh, but the breathtaking uh, technological achievements and megaliths in uh, Peru, e Egypt and Turkey are so far more superior than Stonehenge that we cannot even compare them if we are really evaluating um, the richness of the archaeological landscape as they have put it nicely in words. But they are not using their advanced ground penetrating technology to study anywhere in the plateau of uh, Giza or in Turkey or in Peru. And the excuse for that is the blatant lie that uh, the area of Stonehenge is one of the richest in the world. And what to speak of conducting actual research in the really rich areas? No way, they are too busy uh, making uh, new fences with armed uh, guards and uh, making uh, new regulations and ingenious ways to stop uh, even public researchers who want to do it on, at their own cost. And one last short example of things that are being artificially separated. Prussia. Naturally, as almost all European countries, it has the eagle as its uh, coat of arms. Here it is already single-headed, God knows if that's the original form, or this is the chopped later version of it. And if we have a, a look at the very name of the country, uh, it uh, it looks like uh, uh, Russia or Russia with P in front of it. And of course, uh, the penguins, the scholars assure us that this has nothing to do with the original Slavic uh, root Ras, which uh, as um, the Dubrovnik among uh, Mauro Urbini told us was um, the word from which uh, many nations derived their names, Rasenami, meant in their own language, the scattered ones, and many of them, like for example the Etruscans, derived their names from exactly that same root. But the penguins assure us that this has nothing to do with this uh, root. And that the people decided to call their 
country and themselves just uh, by chance it sounds it sounds and looks exactly uh, like all others and actually it means something from their natural surroundings i really believe that do you and um, this transition this uh, division the falling apart of the great empire was a gradual even at the time of the first world war both sides that were fighting indeed had the same emblem the same symbol the same coat of arms on their uniforms here are the emblems of the both opposing parties so god knows how much the information that we have about even the first world war is relevant and correct after all many people nowadays are not properly informed about the actual situation and reasons for the wars that are going on right now and just a short clarification for those who have uh, not watched the previous episodes yet this empire that i'm uh, mentioning that included all the countries in Europe practically in the past and uh, large parts of Asia, if not again everything, does not correspond to any current um, state or country that exists. It has been wiped out completely and uh, it has been substituted with various smaller countries. Thank you for watching. The Survivor series have um, at least some 10 more episodes to come. I may not uh, be able to make them very soon, but uh, definitely at latest in November and December I will have more time to complete them.